What's up, everybody? Matt Kajewski here, back again with the Stochastic DFS channel, talking some college football DFS. It is week 13. It is our last edition of Maction on this Tuesday. Two games slate, but a lot on the line. Before we get started, make sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you know when this and all other content goes live. We're also brought to you today by Prize Picks. If you've never heard of Prize Picks, you're making lineups with player props, overs, unders, everything from passing yards, touchdowns, receptions. They have it. And it's not just college football, NFL, NHL, NBA. They have all of it. And you can mix and match within your entries. You can do an NBA pick with a college football pick, whatever your expertise is. And click the link in the video description below. You'll get a first match deposit bonus up to $100 in one free month of Stochastic Plus Platinum. That'll give you access to all our tools, including the college football usage tool, which we're going to take you behind the scenes right now if you're on video. And we'll take a look at tonight's games. Two on the docket. Things kick off with Ball State taking on Miami, Ohio. Both of these teams are five and six. That means the winner is bowl eligible. The spread is three points in favor of Miami, Ohio. This is kind of ping-ponged back and forth between minus two to minus three. There are some injuries which are very impactful, and we'll talk about those. The total is 44 and a half. Two very different teams. You have Ball State ninth in pace, a 55% pass rate. Miami, Ohio is 115th in pace, and they have just a 42% pass rate. So let's start with the Ball State side. We'll talk the underdog first. John Paddock is their quarterback. He's one of the more secure guys I think we have on the slate, but he doesn't exactly bring a lot of upside. We're talking negative 84 rushing yards on the year. That definitely lowers your floor. And then he only averages 238 and a half passing yards per game on 41 attempts. That's despite that high pass rate and high pace in this game, especially for Ball State. That's a bit of a concern for me, and it kind of puts him in GPP territory. Not a guy I want to lock into, but if I were ranking these quarterbacks, assuming Rourke plays, I think he would be third for me. And we'll talk about the other guys. If Rourke plays, he's either second or third. I think it becomes a little more interesting there. The run game, this is what we really need to focus on. Carson Steele got injured in their last game. No idea if he's going to play. Don't expect to hear updates until game time. But if, if he can, I think he goes. Again, this is for bowl eligibility. And he averages 26 and a half touches per game, 124 rushing yards per game. Not the most active receiver, but still another 12 yards there through the air. He is the single best workload on the board if he plays. That would make him the number one overall play, the guy you're just trying to lock into your lineups. Boom, that's it. If he doesn't play, things get a lot more interesting because they occasionally use Will Jones as a pass catching specialist. He's 5,400. He hasn't seen more than two carries in any game over their last four. And Vaughn Pemberton has out carried him 36 to 15 on the year. You might be looking at a 50 50 committee with Vaughn Pemberton handling the grinder role and Will Jones handling the pass game role. Again, Pemberton, I mean, 4,200, excuse me, 3,200, he'd probably be playable at this price. We just, I mean, we're rolling the dice here on who we think would get the carries. My tentative lean is that it's Pemberton in the steel role. Will Jones maybe takes on a little more, but still in that passing game role. Moving to the passing game, it's pretty clear what Ball State is doing. They use 12 personnel almost every single play. So you only have two receivers on the field. It's Jay Sean Jackson, Yo Heinz Tyler. Jay Sean Jackson should be the guy we prefer. He gets carries in the run game. He actually has 11 carries this year. And then he averages 11.3 targets per game. Now, Yo Heinz isn't too far behind, averaging 7.4 targets per game. But when we look at total yards, Jackson's just been highly efficient. He has 813 yards in the year. Yo Heinz comes in at 434. And honestly, rather than play Yo Heinz, the tight ends are viable here. Tanner Koziel, his route rate was massive last week. Brady Hunt's route rate, massive. I'll read them off for you guys. It's essentially these guys on the field, and that's it. Jay Sean Jackson, 92% of the routes. Yo Heinz Tyler, 96. Tanner Koziel, 82%. Brady Hunt, 98%. And there's very little variation between these players week in, week out. Like, this is the four they use. That means Tanner Koziel and Brady Hunt are excellent value plays on this slate for a pass-heavy offense. I mean, Brady Hunt had 13 targets last week. Koziel had nine. Highly involved tight ends. Moving to Miami, Ohio, we already talked about their slow nature and pass, excuse me, run heaviness. 
Brett Gabbert got hurt again two weeks ago. Looked pretty gruesome. Didn't play last week. I would be shocked if he plays here. Avian Smith has been competent. He's just a very different player. Highly mobile. 419 rush yards this year. He only averages 115 as a passer, but there's some noise there. You know, games where Gabbert left early. All this to say, he he gets his bread buttered on the ground. Like, this is a mobile quarterback. And at 5,800, if he starts, we get the green light that he's warming up. I think he's the second best quarterback play on the board if Rourke is in. And he becomes the best quarterback play if Rourke is out. So pretty cut and dry here. Avion's a solid play. The backfield's tricky. It's generally a faraway committee, but Keon Mosey missed their most recent game. That reduced it to three players, and it was kind of just two. Tyree Shelton, 16 carries. Kevin Davis, six carries. Kenny Tracy, three. Now, the pass game work is a little bit different here. So when you go down and you look at total touches, things get a little more interesting. Kevin Davis actually leads this backfield in targets at 18, followed by Kenny Tracy and Tyree Shelton. If I'm going to play one of them, it's going to be Tyree Shelton, just based on that most recent workload where he did have the 18 touches, 16 carries. But I'd watch this pregame. It becomes an interesting GPP situation if Mosey is out. If he returns, you're looking at a committee which would make this less attractive. So this is a pregame. Got to watch and see to find out how viable Shelton actually is. And then the other guys, I mean, I'm probably not playing a lot of Kevin Davis or Kenny Tracy, just GPP plays. The receiving game, Mac Hippenhammer, he's the number one for this team. He has a 34% target share, just 7.5 targets per game. That's because they're run heavy. 61 and a half receiving yards per game. Hippenhammer's fine. He has the ceiling. He probably won't pop over some of the receivers we already talked about, like Jay Sean Jackson. But if you're looking for a contrarian piece, he's he's definitely there. The wide receiver two for this team is Miles Marshall. 3.2 targets per game, just 30 yards. You're not going to get a lot of viability out of the ancillary pieces just because they are so run heavy. Nobody averages outside of hip and hammer more than 30 and a half receiving yards per game. Tight end Jack Holder on his third with 26 yards per game. And I'll bring you to the routes just because this is, I think, a little more, I don't know, eye-opening when it comes to potential darts. Last week, Mac hip and hammer, 91%, no surprise there. Miles Marshall, 81%, no surprise there. Wide receiver three, Jalen Walker. He saw his routes cut from 91% to 55. I don't know if this is an injury or what, but Walker certainly has more route variability than Hip and Hammer and Marshall. So he's a little riskier in my opinion. Then they use three tight ends. It's not just Colderon. Colderon actually saw his routes cut from 69% to 34. And that was with Nate Mersh coming up for more routes. Matt Jorson for more routes. Ultimately, it's a nasty rotation behind these guys. You're not going to see a lot of consistency one way or the other. So to rank them, for me, it's number one, Hip and Hammer, number two, Marshall, number three, Walker. But when it comes to Marshall and Walker, I would rather play like a Cozil, you know, a tight end for Ball State than those guys. Second game, we have Bowling Green taking on Ohio. If Ohio wins, they go to the MAC championship. If Bowling Green wins, they can go to the MAC championship as well. So this everything's on the line in this game. It's a seven point spread in favor of Ohio. These teams are both fairly slow and pass heavy. You've got Bowling Green 79th in pace. Ohio is 110th. Pass rates for both teams. Bowling Green is 53%. Ohio is 50 and a half. Bowling Green, signal caller Matt McDonald, very expensive on this slate. 7,600. I think I prefer both of the quarterbacks in the other game. Just, you know, with Ball State and Paddock, it's a price thing. With Miami, Ohio, Avian Smith just runs way more. McDonald is negative 11 rushing yards on the year. He averages 241 pass yards on 34 and a half attempts. He's essentially middling floor, low ceiling option at quarterback, GPP viable, and that's it. In the backfield, they've kind of just isolated this to Jason Patterson of late. 15 carries in their most recent game, somewhat active in the past game as well. He had a target last week. This is a guy that's receiving more and more work, and he's only 4,400. I think he's he's viable here. And you're seeing some zeros for Jamal Johnson, Teron Keith. They both played last week. These players weren't injured. The backfield's just condensing a little bit here. The, the only concern is Teron Keith has been the pass catching back all year, and he still saw five targets last week. So it's not like Patterson is working into a three-down workload. This is still probably a committee to some degree. It's just more split into individual roles. Keith, more the passing game back. Patterson, more your early down grinder. 
Do with that what you will. They're both Chiefs. I can see GPP flyers mainly on Patterson here. Receiving game, still pretty condensed here. Odu Hilaire is the number one. It's not even close. 63 yards per game for him on 6.9 targets. That's jumped up to 8.3 targets per game in the last four. So he's become increasingly involved. And from there, the routes are kind of exactly what you'd expect. It's really only Hilaire and Tyrone Broden on the field for every single snap. Hilaire had a 93% route rate. Broden was at 81%. And then from there, like Titan Christian Sims, 59%. Wide receiver three, CJ Lewis, 59%. Harold Fannin, their second tight end, he was at 46%. So you can see Christian Sims and ha Harold Fannin are almost like a one-for-one -one split. And then with C.J. Lewis playing a little less, Austin Osborne jumped up for 22% of the rounds. Now, Austin Osborne's missed a lot of time this year, but he was a focal point of the offense last year. There's a chance he just becomes more and more involved and plays more and more. I don't, I don't think this is likely. I don't think he's ahead of Broden or Hilaire. But in big tournaments tonight, Osborne is somewhat viable at 4,400. I wish he was like 3K, but he's not. So honestly, if you're playing cash, low risk contests, it's Broden and Hilaire. If you want to get dicey and run some risky GPPs, Osborne could make some sense on the hope that he plays more. The Ohio side of this, big implied team total here. Again, this game has a seven point spread in favor of Ohio. The total is 55. That's much higher than the 45 on the other side. So Ohio has an awesome team total. The concern is Court Curtis Rourke left their most recent game with a knee injury, and it was called a knee sprain, which has, I, I mean, you're not going to get any details from the coaching staff, but if you just look at what players typically miss time-wise with knee sprains, this ranges from a week to, to four weeks. Like there's varying degrees of how injured people with knee sprains can be. All this to say, there's a decent chance Rourke misses this game. There's a decent chance Rourke plays in this game. And he's limited mobility-wise. And there's a chance he plays and he's fine. So we're going to have to watch warm-ups closely, see what to do with Rourke. This offensive line is terrible. And Rourke has kind of played hero ball all year. He is the best quarterback in the MAC, So his absence would not only be impactful for the spread, but for DFS purposes, it makes him tricky to play at 8,300. But ultimately, he is the number one quarterback on the slate given health. 245 rushing yards on the year. Averages 296 and a half passing yards per game on 32 attempts. So you can see the efficiency. He's awesome. In the run game, we have Say Bangura. He's working his way back from injury, and it appears he's almost fully healthy. After the injury, he's now carried the ball 20 and 23 times. If you look at overall touches, that's 23 touches and 24 touches. Bangura is an awesome play here, trying to jam him in, especially with the potential limitedness of Rourke. And then other than that, the only other news in the backfield is they occasionally use a change of pace. Nolan McCormick got hurt in their second most recent game. He did not play last week. That allowed Jake Netherton to pop up for nine carries. He probably is in that range, especially if Ohio is winning. But if McCormick returns, he should be the change of pace. If he's out, Netherton should be the change of pace. These guys have GPP viability if you're playing large tournaments. Then finally, in the receiving game, we saw Ohio narrow this group when the chips were down. They needed to play their guys. They essentially removed Miles Cross. He did not see a target. His routes dropped severely, and they played just three guys, Sam Wiglutz, James Bostick, Jacoby Jones. Wiglutz is far and away ahead of Bostick and Jones. He has a 7.7 .7 targets per game on the year, averages 73 and a half yards. From there, Bostick and Jones are pretty close. We're talking 46 targets for Bostick, 42 for Jones. On the year, Jones has more yards, 603 to 538 for Bostic. They're very close in price, too. Jones, 5,400, Bostic, 49. I think I'm going to go with Bostic just as the cheaper option in a very, very tight situation, but it's close. You can play them both. Whoever's left in price is where I would probably go there. It's a rotation at tight end, so the ancillary pieces like Will Kasmerick, Alec Burton, I don't have a ton of interest in them. I think you could do better with some of the cheaper plays elsewhere. But that'll do it for the slate. Let me know in the comment section what you think. If I missed something, would love to hear it. You can also reach out to me on Twitter at Matt underscore Kajeski. DMs are open. Otherwise, hit the thumbs up button on the way out. Subscribe to the channel. Those both help us a ton. And if you've done that, thank you very much. Otherwise, good luck. We'll be back for the Egg Bowl on Thursday. And then, of course, we've got the Thanksgiving Hangover Friday slate and Saturday. We'll see you guys then, and good luck.